feel like I've just played that solo. Yes, I'm Jason Solomons, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Picture House Central. Thank you so much for, uh, I hope, enjoying I Called Him Morgan. Uh, it's a film I saw at Venice uh, first last year. It then went on to Toronto uh, and then played the New York Festival, New York Film Festival and the London Film Festival. Which is a brilliantly auspicious start for this documentary. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We're going to find out more about how it was uh, made uh, and the story behind it and the music behind it as well because you've just sat through, you know, 15, 20 Lee Morgan solos, blistering stuff, ladies and gentlemen. I'm surprised your heads haven't kind of, you know, fallen off from nodding. I know mine has. Uh, we are delighted uh, here at Picture House Central to have with us the maker of I Called Him Morgan, Casper Collin. Yeah, Casper uh, uh, is in fact the director, the producer, the, the, the kind of progenitor of the story of Lee Morgan. Casper, uh, I, I mean, I knew Lee Morgan's music and I knew how energetic he was and young he was and blistering in a way. And I knew he died young, like so many jazz mm -hmm. musicians. But the, the myth had around him, I, I, I assumed in my head, without wanting to find out more, that he died of a cocktail of, of drugs or something like that, which is what took so many lives. The story behind it was, of course, much more moving, much more complex. What was it that drew you into, into, into telling the, the, the truth for, for a generation later? Thank you. It, it's like, a, do you want like the medium reply or the long <laughs> reply? I think they've seen the long reply. Uh, <laughs> the, the medium. See, the medium. Yeah, oh, so right. like how you, so you just want to have like a vague feeling about <laughs> <laughs> expectations on this reply. You, yeah, I mean, I made another film before uh, called My Name is Albert Eiler, which is about Monica Fridias. We should, yes, we should I mean, point out, maybe the people don't know, these good people might not know, you are Swedish. I'm Swedish, yeah, that's true. Mm, that's so, we should have started with that, so, yeah, it's good to know. So right? What's a s nice Swedish boy like you doing in the story like this? I don't know, I don't know really. <laughs> but, but I made that film. Uh, and yeah, after my name that, is Albert Eiler, it's yeah, called. Yeah, it took seven years. Uh, that was my first feature documentary f feature film it went well but I was quite sure being a filmmaker educated a filmmaker I thought I was kind of finished with making jazz films uh, so, so I wanted to devote my time to doing other stuff uh, because and jazz and films are hard right uh, I mean it's, it's yeah <laughs> but, but it's also uh, the most fun thing I can think of because that that's I mean I love this music so much that that's also why I started to make this film because in the midst of working on other projects, uh, thinking I would never do another jazz film, I was just watching YouTube. Uh, and this clip that the film ends with, with the uh, Art Bacon Jazz Messengers playing that there, and with Lee Morgan's incredible solo there, <laughs> I just watched that uh, on YouTube uh, seven, eight years ago. And it was his solo that just, just blew me away. I had never heard anyone play trumpet like that before. And at that time, of course, I know about Lee Morgan, uh, and I have listened to a lot of Blue Notes music, like Wayne Shorter and other great artists, Mobley. Uh, but Lee, I hadn't really gone into. Uh, so I was, that was just fantastic. I, I know vaguely about him, what you're talking about. I think all music lovers know that, I mean, that he was this wonder kid making, you know, signed for, for Blue Note when he was like 18 years old, made a lot of fantastic records. And then there was some heroin, but it was Sidewinder, and then he was shot by a woman. But, I mean, he was shot by, by a woman, and I didn't know more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was from this music. I listened to this on repeat for a week, like it is when you find something new. Uh, went on like that. I was really in love with the music, and I, I started to think, is there maybe a film here? Mm -hmm. and, and I realized, you know, you do this first research, and I realized that there was quite a few people still alive that seemed to have played with him and were close to him and I checked what kind of archive material there is and that's what, what you do I mean is there at all possible to do a film mm -hmm. and you don't know but then I, I just reached out to quite a few of those people that, that were still alive and I started to talk to them and many of them started to talk about the last four years in Lee Morgan's life uh, who, who, who such people as for example I was like Billy Harper and Paul West and and uh, Jimmy Heath I talked to to earlier uh, so some of the great yes. great jazz musicians of the time the great bassist the great almost session musicians of Bluno Th they were I mean the amazing musicians but but what happened was that when, when I st they directly led me into those last four years in Lee's life uh, and started to talk about that they, they seemed to still be very intrigued about this 
and they started to talk about this woman named Helen. Uh, they started to talk about her very lovingly and <laughs> passionately. Uh, and uh, they said that Lee had had extreme problems with heroin and were about to die, and they seemed very that they couldn't really do too much about it themselves. Uh, and then this woman helped him, I mean, as much as she could. And she was the one that stepped in and became the one that was on his side. And in a way, brought him back. Uh, and so this then I realized. story you didn't know? No, and then I realized that this is the same woman that shot him. And that was like suddenly you're in like this Greek tragedy or Shakespearean drama of some kind. Uh, I didn't know that. Mm. So, so, of course, that intrigued me. But that was also, I mean, sitting there talking to those people that were still alive and realizing that several of them, they were there the last night. Uh, and if they weren't, they were still, of course, very touched about this. Uh, but uh, that was a feeling that that night uh, they, they didn't just lose one good friend, Lee, because he was killed. They, they lost two good friends. And before that... He you mean Helen as yeah, well? Yeah, Helen, because she disappeared into jail and they lost contact with her. And, then and she'd she been this woman who looked after everyone and yeah, made but the I mean dinner. They, and they loved both of them uh, because they were always together. Uh, and, and before that, I had understood that a lot of people that loved Lee tended to almost hate Helen because, yeah, I, mean, I mean, she took their hero away. Uh, and I mean, there's... There's some logic to that, yeah. uh, uh, but that fascinated me a lot, talking to, to those people that actually were there, that they still today were trying to make sense of, and several of them seems to, it's almost a forgiveness. Right. I mean, it, obviously the film starts with the, in, the interview of, of Helen, yeah. in a way, and, and we wouldn't, you know, you you'd think, well, you don't have a film and that with, unless you have this strange story of Helen and uh, talking to this teacher down yeah. in in the, in the south years, many many years later. But was that the starting point for you, or was that a story that came to you later and suddenly you found out, well, I've actually got some, fo well, footage, some audio mm -hmm. of Helen. That's part of the, the first research. Uh, or the first research sessions you do. And, and I, I find that early, that was in 2009, that uh, wonderful person, Larry Randy Thomas, who made that interview, he had a blog. Uh, so I just Googled and I found it, and you could read parts of this, this interview, and it just sounded very interesting. And then I realized that, yeah, Helen actually lived until 1996. Wow. And then she died, but she made this interview just one month before. So I contacted him and he sent me a copy of it, so not the real cassette, <laughs> but but a copy of it, uh, and I will never forget. I mean, the first time I listened to it. So you got it in the. It came in uh, like a like a, a CD. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he sent a CD, CD not even yes. an MP3. But it came in, in the <laughs> actual post. Came Some things are still yeah. sacred, right? So so because it wasn't just the story she's telling. It was. Uh, I mean, the way she's telling it, and and the sound of her voice. And also the quality of that tape, that recording, it was like a dreamlike almost with all those his sounds. And <laughs> but somewhere in there, this this incredibly story, tragic. But I mean, it's not just tragic. It's also the the time, the lovely time they shared together in there. Uh, but of course, it, it ended in a way that is very tragic. But but it's not just tragic. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, I think the French would call it may maybe the French would call it a crime passionnel. Yes. I know if you were if you were making the, I mean it's interesting that you say you you, you were, is there a movie there? I didn't know if you or your immediate thought what is there a documentary there or did you think is there a a feature film here because you know as, a, as the French might do a kind of love story that's gone into such jazzy romanticism that we could mm -hmm. kind of have a murder going on here or, or a crime passionnel. You know what I mean? It's it's a very romantic notion. Uh, yeah, perfectly understand. I, I mean, I really want to be clear with that, that I'm really coming from the music side there. But suddenly, as I said, I were in this story and with this, those people that wanted to share their memories. Uh, and it was, yeah, you, you, you continue to, to make. And then, I, I mean, I found this, this uh, interview very, very early that Larry, this fantastic teacher, made, you know. and. Uh, in the beginning, you know, having that interview, I didn't know that that was possible to use. I mean, because the technical quality was that bad in mm -hmm. a way. But but what I did was, 
because also in my previous film there we have Abed Island's own voice that I worked with. So, so I'm, I'm very much into in filmmaking. I love to work with audio <laughs> and sound uh, a lot. So, so I was also fascinated just of, of just the quality of this recording. So I was just trying to edit down her voice and edit it down to, I think, 11 chapters. It's pretty much the chapters that's still in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, but I worked also with three brilliant editors and uh, that was my, one of my main responsibilities as a filmmaker because I was producer and director in this film. Uh, and my responsibility as, as a producer, what I learned from my previous film was that we need a lot of editing time for this film. Mm. And I think we edited the film for 12 months, but we spread it out over three years. And I know that this, I will need that to, to but it's also needed because I want to integrate the music there all the way. And we worked so much with really get the music in there. And, and I fight it a lot with, with the editors. I'm an editor myself, but I really need those guys to, to get it all together. Because you, uh, the thing with, with jazz uh, docs, as we said, but jazz is mm -hmm. difficult because you have, you have to satisfy, there's the great story, of course, that everyone can get involved in. Then there's the scene, there's New York, and then there's kind of these characters. But you've also got jazz purists who want, you know, this version, not that version. They, oh, you should have used the 1957 version, the live version, the studio version, or the, that take, or the re-edit, you know. I'm and, a jazz purist, so... Right, <laughs> so exactly, I get the feeling. Yeah. Yes, so so that's what I want to say, that was about, I had to fight with the editors that they really go for a story, and that, you know, they want to almost reduce the music to some background. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be too hard because they, they love the music too. Uh, but but I fight it hard to, to keep the music and and to keep the space for the music to develop in, in some parts. And uh, that is something I as editor work with uh, is to work with those parts where kind of the, the visuals and the music Mm -hmm. integrate in a way what were the i mean we we, we we all saw the final credits there um and i'm sure people were waiting to sort of you know there were some d morgan tracks that you know and some people that you don't and some you were expecting maybe there would be in the film and some aren't in there mm -hmm. um i think well, i said there were 15 or so how, how many tracks did you use were there some that you wanted to put in but couldn't were there some versions you couldn't get hold of give us a little jazz exploration of the of, of, the, of the, 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 I suppose clearing all the music as well. I don't know if it's ambiently available. I don't, I don't know what the, the, the search in itself is, is some kind of detective story finding some of these versions. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a long, long job to, to get it together. I mean, and that's a responsibility too when I make a film like this is that the music really needs to, as I said, be integrated in the film. And uh, we, we also want to mention that it was a lot of work with the, uh, with the sound, because how are we going to present those fantastic blown up records in, in the cinema? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it, it's when you go into the cinema, and then if you just play those this music, the cinema system is a little different. So so we had to find out how to present it. So I had some great jazz musicians in Sweden who were there, and <laughs> we tried it out. So how, how this is going to sound. Uh, but I mean, y you start out, I started out like, like this good, good schoolboy with having like the best of Lee Morgan, <laughs> yeah. in a way, because that's where, where you start. Mm -hmm. but, but then I made this more and more to my personal journey into Lee Morgan and what I found out is what made me going, in a way. Uh, so I think all the choices is my is personal, but, but it's it also, of course, choices that should fit into the film. So were, in you, a way. Uh, were you like list constantly listening? You had it on your iPod or your, in your earphones as you're journeying to the studio? I don't know. I have a romantic vision of where you work. I don't know where you really <laughs> work at home in your bedroom. I don't know. But maybe you're on the... On, you do you have a tube in Stockholm? With the, no, you don't. You have the bus. <laughs> or no. But are you on there with your iPod just kind of you know, nodding away, finding a new solo that you're like, I've got to get there. Like, obsessive. Because it's it's music that gets into your soul, right? Into it your is. feet, into your heart. I would, that's part of it. I mean, you, you find out, you really listen and find out this this is fantastic. Can we include this? How can we include it? Um, and you then you, you sit there. And that's the work I do as an editor. I sit and try the music a lot in the film uh, because the, the, the other people in the film, in the editing, they, I mean, of course, they like the music, but they're not like... It's not that it's important not for film, them. You know, exactly. <laughs> no, but it's also, not their film. But some of the time you must have had music and you think, well, have I got anything... Obviously, your first 
impulse, uh, impulse as a filmmaker is, have I got anything to illustrate this, to go with this? I can't just throw this music no. in. Where, where does it come in his career? Does that, do I have footage to, to kind of illustrate yeah. this? So it's, it's I mean, it, it's, um, it's complex. It's, it's very complex. So there, therefore, you need to, it's a lot of trial and error. And what, one thing, I mean, of course, is the visualization of, of, of this film. Uh, if we go from the music for a while, is I mean, uh, it was I mean fantastic because Lee Morgan seemed to be one of the most well documented musicians from this era I in still photos. Yeah, he was a he was hot, right? Whatever you call that th those days. Yeah, hot, I think. But he was a good looking, fashionable man. He was, but it was also because of I mean he was one of the most well recorded. I think he and, and Hank Mobley was the most well recorded in the sixties for for Blown Up or. Uh, uh, two of them, uh, at least, uh, and I mean, I didn't know about the extent of the blown out photo archive when I started this. The photo archive, the of photo the archive of their own stuff. Yes, and I mean, because you know, blown out, it's it's. Um, we know about their covers, and we know yeah. about their cover art, <laughs> the recording, but uh, they have their own archive just for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and one, one of the guys is the, the two German guys, and one of the guys he he is a. Um, He's a very, very great photographer. Is uh, it, this is Francis Wolf. Yes, is it? and he, and the other one is Alfred Lyon. And uh, Wolf, he documented every session with his camera, uh, and not like one shot, like a lot of them. So I know vaguely about this, but I didn't really believe how much that would be. But I visited. Uh, it is a mosaic outside of uh, with with his, uh, run by Michael Koskuna, who has that archive today, the full Luna Food Archive. <laughs> I went there, I think, the first time in 2010. Where is this? Where is it? Uh, it's outside New York. I don't remember the name of that little town. You were too excited. I was too excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stamford, I think it is. Yeah. And I went there, I think, uh, three times. But the first time, I just went there to meet him and just to, you know, see, is, is there any photos at all? And then he was this kind guy who has made a bunch of photos for me. but. That was perfect. That was 30 photos that were all great, but those were the photos everyone has seen, like it's been on the covers and been in the different magazines. And, and I politely asked him, are there more? And he kind of smiled at me and said, yeah, come here. And he took me into this fantastic archive. Uh, and it's the actual camera, room. The actual room. And uh, with all this, I mean, very, very well organized. Right. So I spent a day there <gasps> first. I mean, and it's like... It's like, I don't know, it Aladdin's a gold mine. cave, gold mine, whatever. That was a gold mine. And, and then I realized, and I found that, I think that was like 165, 167 contact sheets from uh, sessions that Lee Morgan was on. And that, it's like 16, 1700 pictures or something. Uh, all, but all taken by Francis Wolf. Yes. While they're trying to record the stuff as well. Yes. Because they were great producers, Mo right? As yes. Well. Most of them are not from the actual recordings, but from the rehearsal sessions, because they didn't want the, the sound of the camera uh, and distract the, 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 the players during the recording. Uh, but that was amazing. I mean, and the thing is, I mean, as you saw in the film, Lee was signed with Luna when he was 18 years old in 1956, like this little boy. And then. He was documented in black and white uh, up until 1967 for 11 years. And that was the extent of the black and white material. That was the 1,700 pictures. So we could follow him for s those 11 years. And we can see in the film that quite a lot of things happens. Mm. And, but the thing that looking at those pictures were like, I mean, you could really see the communion between the musicians and the happy days in the studio. Uh, I mean, because in the film, the, the drama comes from some of those juxtapositions yeah. and the looks that you're given. Were you, when you flicking through, were, were you like seeing, oh, look, Wayne likes him there and Wayne's looking disappointing there? And yeah. could, was, it, was the narrative taking place in your head as you it were was. flicking through? And I remember this very clear. I had, I mean, what I did was because I couldn't have like made copies of all of this, it would cost a fortune. <laughs> James Bond with your spy. Yeah, I mean, it, I couldn't. So, so what I did was that I just made like Xerox copies of everything and took them home and I had an assistant just scanning everything and we worked from Xerox copies that we just blown up with it. Mm -hmm. And then we made a first selection. I had an assistant just printing them out. And me and one of the editors were editing in her apartment, Eva Hilstrom, that made my previous film with me. Uh, she. We, we kind of were crawling around in her apartment in Stockholm on the, on the living room floor, just like making sense of this. And it was just fantastic with those small narratives within this massive material, like small stories 
that I really wanted to keep, you know. And uh, some of them, they are still in there. But it was like this happily that's joking and, and kind of keeping the people around him feeling good in a way, uh, in a generous way, I felt. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that was wonderful. But I mean, in, and that was also this almost spiritual level because you know the music that is so fantastic and you used to see all those pictures. But then, of course, suddenly you see this pictures with the bandage head of Lee and like what is that I didn't know about that at this point and then I continued to do interviews and, and I understood that okay actually this is what they're talking about that he fell um, and burned his head I mean uh, and and uh, so when I because that is the thing also what is it was quite easy to have a lot of the people in the film to participate but there were two people that were difficult was Wayne. It took me four years. Mm -hmm. I that was part of my interest in the music that I really wanted to talk to him about this time because I'm so fascinated about this time myself. Well, which period is? I this mean, this this is the period they chaired in like Outbreak and Yes Messengers, late fifties, early sixties, and he has been very reluctant to, to talk about this, and he has never really talked about Lee. And of some reason, it took four years before this happened. And, and yet, Wayne Shorter is the surviving godfather of, of that era. He is, and now he has started to do more of those interviews. I understand, but but we did, and I had planned very much of him. You know, that's something I do as a, as a director. I, I I have a couple, or rather, a lot of those pictures with me, and, and show <coughs> to them just to to, uh, to them getting back to that yeah. time in a way and. Yeah, then we had this little scene with Lee, with, with Wayne looking at this picture with, mm. with Lee bandaged. Uh, of course, I didn't know what would happen, but of course, I was interested as, as a director. What would happen if he see this again? Do he does does he remember that? Mm. Uh, so that's how, how that happened. It's um, it's it's very moving the Wayne the Wayne shorter uh, stuff uh, as well. It, why do you think he might have been reluctant to, to talk about it? Is that I mean, he's he's a, as an artist himself, he's always forging forward and moving forward is it is it because he doesn't view the past or is he now seeing the value of that past i th i mean there, there are never no, no simple answers to that i know at, at this period in his life he was very much into writing uh, a symphony and working with the symphony orchestra i think that this premiered i don't remember what year but that was during this era when he was really into that uh but it's also because of i mean the sadness attached to this of mm -hmm. course uh there's a genuine. I mean, he and Lee, they were they were so close. Uh, yeah. They were really buddies, uh, and he was there when this when he fell. I think that's one of the things of your film we forget because it's so long ago, and, and, and it happened to quite a lot of jazz musicians. There was, there, as I sort of say, you, you kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they had heroin addictions, and they they died tragically young, and it, you know, it happened for everyone from Bird to Coltrane to. You know, it, it's a sort of trajectory that we expect in a, in, a, in a jazz musician, but of course it affects so many lives. They're band members, they're friends with people, yeah. uh, and this period is not, you know, it was a difficult period in terms of, you know, cabaret cards and racism and uh, and, and, and these things that are that are coming up. There's so much that we can talk about, Casper Moore, but I, I realise I've, I've hogged you too no, much. No, that's okay. Our that's solo, okay. Our solo that was just on one thing long. I think yeah, I should, should add b before we leave that, is, is that, I mean, we can talk about this music and those musicians for hours, and, and I would love to do that, but but somehow Helen became a very important character in this film. Uh, and for me, as, as, as a filmmaker, I always want to make a film that I want to see myself. I mean, it's, it's in a way needless to, to say, but I mean, that's very important. I mean, so uh, I, had, I, I love this time, I love this music, I love this period era, but I had never really, looked at it from a, from a, a, a woman's perspective uh, and listened to her story. It was very fascinating for me and I really wanted to see what happened if, if we looked at this from her perspective. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, it's such a male world and we forget that, you know, there were women <laughs> involved with this creation of this subculture, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and it is one of the first times we get that, that, that look in there. Thank you. I'm, yeah, but I, I think this film for me grow into being this love letter to both Lee and Helen but also the music that does the music that brought them together yeah. in a way that that's <laughs> how I thought about it and I thought one good description of this film was 
the second time we showed it in, in Venice, the, the world premiere, and then the day after the world premiere, I flew to Telluride <laughs> to show it. And the first person, or one of the first person I met there was uh, this uh, great uh, opera director, Peter Sellers. And he, he was, he really loved the film. So he hugged me and embraced me and said, oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's you made the duet between Lee and Helen. <laughs> and I had a, wow, that's a nice description because I, I thought, I mean, in a way, because I worked really about, I mean, it was the sound of her voice in a way that I love. Because that, you know, that builds to a tragic kind of denouement. It is, and yeah. uh, But yet it's beautiful within harmony and it's a duet. Um, it's time to bring in the rest of the band for some yeah. for some kind of trading fours with the audience. It has reps. I, I um, totally, yeah. Yes. Um, so any questions from, from you guys as well for Casper? There's a gentleman straight up there, record time. I'm not sure whether this guy was in the same sort of fold as Wayne Shorter reluctantly not wanted to talk about it, but Harold Mayburn, is he still alive? He is, yeah, and I mean, he, he's in the footage there, he's playing, but I, I wanted Harold, I wanted Curtis Fuller, and uh, Curtis, we should have made an interview, but uh, for some reason he, <laughs> yeah, he never t turn, turned out to <laughs> when, when, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's part of doing this, I mean, it's jazz, man. Uh, <laughs> for some reason he decided not to do it in the end, uh, that's okay, I have to respect that, uh, and with Harold, I really wanted him in the film, and I also had the respect that. But it was also because of his his wife died uh, during this period, and you know. Uh, but I, I know he's seen the film and he, he loves it. Uh, that means a lot to me. So yeah, that's a very reasonable question. Thank you for doing this film because this was part of my era of getting into jazz, and I can say I've had the pleasure of meeting him on three or four occasions. The period that, why well, this film is very interesting to me because the period when Lee Morgan was alive, there was a radical dimension in jazz where uh, you couldn't call it modern, modern jazz, but as young Afro-Caribbeans, that was one of the jazz music you could dance in the club and a lot of British bands was inspired. And I can't understand how you didn't mention that his famous f f The Sidewinder. Moaning, <laughs> as well, yeah. But one of the things I didn't thought I thought could have been involved the period that we were going through, as well, was the civil rights movement, yeah. And some of these musicians were very radical against it. I he Char Char the, the Vietnam War, yeah. I he Charlie Mingus don't drop that H bomb on me, you know. Yeah. And um, his music, I, I think, was so radical. Another thing I thought you should have mentioned was the sessions, the, some of the greatest sessions they had. Monday nights, Monday night at the Birdland. Because yeah. when I actually met Lee, I asked him who his favorite musician was. And he, he said Clifford Brown mm -hmm. and Roy Eldridge. Mm -hmm. and don't forget as well, you had a, I was one of those young musicians at the time as well. You know, and you had Tony Williams on the scene as well. And um, I forget the piano, pianist from Weather Report. He went on. He used to jam a lot with the Lee Morgan, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Sure. Yes. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, but that, that's, I mean, that's... Uh, but the Sidewinder, and that was... The Sidewinder, that's how, I mean, that's the first jazz <laughs> record I danced yeah. to, I think, yeah. you know. Yeah. The, I mean, I mean, of, I mean, I mean, th those questions are obvious. I had them a lot, I mean, because people want, uh, want stuff in there. I want stuff in there, but it's, <laughs> it, it's just impossible. You have to focus, uh, and this film has, came to be about this relationship uh more focused on that but but so i mean and also it is still political to me uh but to make it work uh, as a piece uh, as i want it uh, if you open doors to different stuff it's, it's very difficult to do that when you make films it's very difficult to just open new doors yeah i uh, mean we we got soundtracked ourselves talking yeah. about the music whereas in <laughs> fact that, that there's a love story this this tragic love story going on uh which focuses your film into the, into yeah. the story of lee and helen we almost forget helen as well as musicians we kind of like let's get let's deal with the with the music yeah i mean they, they are there and you, you have glimpses glimpses into that era i hope i mean uh, a feeling of it but but uh, Sidewinder, that, that is, I mean, that is funny in a way because that's his most well-known, and I don't want to say anything that will, will upset anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I was coming from more of this, uh, uh, I mean, free, freer jazz 
into this. So that solo that we talked about, when I heard Lee play that, I had heard Sidewinder, but Sidewinder was never really my music, where I was coming from. It was nothing wrong with it. But it was this solo in that there that really went mm -hmm. right into me. And then it was Search for No Land. And this was, I realized that we had this Lee Morgan that people did not talk too much about that was this searching young artist yeah. and this fantastic artist. Yes, I mean, he's a great, ba a great balladeer rather as yeah, well. Yeah, he was that too, but also that fantastic music he's as actually making where he has his second act mm -hmm. when Helen helped him back, Live at the Lighthouse and so on. So in a way, yeah, you, you could say that it's bad that I focused on that part of Lee's music, but that was I, I something I did. But, but in a way, in the end, you know, they're all similar kind of era. We, we sat there, we tried a little bit Sidewinder, but it did never, it wasn't possible to, it's odd, but it, it didn't. We'll all go home and put doom, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just for you, I mean, out. I'm going to do it myself. And didn't that didn't work out. I, I, you, you came next, but we do have a gentleman behind you who waited patiently, so I'm going to go for him, and then I'll go for you again. Is that? Is that all right? So the gentleman that had his hand up, and then we'll come back to you. First, thanks very much. I enjoyed the documentary tremendously. It's wonderful. I, I had no idea of the story, and I was very struck watching it. There's a scene with one of the interviewees, I think it's, it's Wayne Shorter, says that uh, when he was playing with Art Blakey, um, Art Blakey was always urging him on the bandstand, telling your story. Well, I think you've told his story for me in a sort of cinematic medium, so thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you. Um, the question I wanted to ask was, right at the end, um, what do you think was Helen's motivation for eventually agreeing to the interview? Because if I understood it correctly, she'd met the teacher some years before, yes. and he'd been asking her for an interview. She did this interview, and a month later she was dead. Yeah. Um, was it a long illness? Did she know that she didn't have long? Was this by way of uh, wanting to unburden herself? Do you know the circumstances? There will never be a, a, I mean, like a final answer to that question, uh, but but I think I mean it, it's it's in the middle of some some part there, and I think you're into it. I think it has to do with, it might at least have to do with that she know that she, it was about to, she was about to disappear, and she finally wanted to, tell her version of it. I can also say I mean that, uh, just to fill in a little, little bit there because I'm, I know. I mean, uh, one of her songs is in the film, and uh, I also know the, the grandsons, one of the grandsons <laughs> that, that I met in, in L.A. and so on, and they told me about Helen. Uh, I mean, they uh, when they were kids, no one ever told them that she'd been to jail. <laughs> I, I, there were a version of this film but with some people that worked with her in the church when she w went back to Wilmington, but they, <laughs> they didn't know that she'd shot Lee Morgan, mm -hmm. but they didn't know who Lee Morgan was. Mm -hmm. but, but anyhow, they didn't know that she'd shot someone, that she had been in to jail. So how many years did she do? That was short. I mean, that was, that was, that was just like two years. Uh, and then it was, do you say parole? Uh, yes, yeah. parole. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, that, that is, I mean, we can go into that as well, but that is like a film itself. How did she actually get out mm -hmm. so quickly? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know? I heard rumors yeah. That, yeah. that the musicians actually got, um, they actually got behind her because they realized how much support she gave Lee. Yeah. And, and I think they gave, I'm, I might be wrong, but that's what Val Wilmer told me, because Val Wilmer's here. Um, she, she actually said that, that they came to her defense because they realized how supportive um, she was. Yeah. Like lower ebbs. Some, uh, I don't know if I can talk about this. It, I mean, but, 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 but in a way, I mean, it's a long time ago now, but yes, some of them did. But it was still, a lot of people hated Helen for what she did. And a lot of, uh, there are still musicians that are not happy about what she, I mean, of course. I mean, obviously, it's wrong to kill someone. <laughs> but but, but uh, we can agree on that. But uh, the thing is that they also know how bad Lee was when she stepped in and that he, uh, he, he could have died <laughs> much earlier <laughs> if he wasn't there. Mm. I mean, it's the great irony to it. Uh, but yes, some of them, uh, Reggie Workman and a few others, were there, supported with, with making like a, a supporting concert and brought, brought some money in. 
uh, for some bail money. Uh-huh. But but yeah, finally. Oh, that was a bit of a weird concert. The 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 free Helen Morgan concert. Yeah, but also there was people that did not want to be yeah. associated with that, and in the end just did not participate. Uh, but but what happened was that they managed to get a fantastic lawyer. Uh, that had worked to get some of these civil rights leaders out of prison. And, uh, yeah, it's quite a corrupt mm. system at this time. But he he knew one of the lawyers, <laughs> or the judges, the judges. Uh, so he told her that, uh, I mean, she's called for those hearings. Yeah. And, and you need to go to those hearings. You have to. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come <laughs> until this judge is there that I know. So uh, there was like 13 or 14 hearings, and mm. then finally it was this judge. And I thought this is this is bullshit. I mean, this is like a good story. But then, and for a long time, those reports were missing. Uh, but I finally found them. It's true. It's like 13 or 14 or 15 hearings. And then finally, this happens. <laughs> wow. so it's like a film in itself. So it, was, it, it is bound up with the civil rights movement, as the gentleman who's yeah, got the loo uh, uh, now sort of says it is. It is we're, <laughs> we're in this, yeah, he's like, yeah. No, you see, now he found yeah. out. So, you know, as you say, that, has, so, said, it, it, that, that period has its own, it has its own mythology. And I mean, as I mentioned, Cream Passionnel, there's kind of, Jazz, yeah. jazz has its own rules as well. It, 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 it seems. I mean, you know, you you, you did well to, to find it, and, and as the gentleman says, it's a fascinating question. We are going to have to wrap yeah. up very soon, and I don't I don't want to to um, not come back to the, the the lady who I said that we could have her. Absolutely quick. Thank you very much. And I get this feel that it was very much about that relationship, and the music just sort of fitted in. That was how I sort of saw it. I'm a criminal lawyer, so in light of all what you just said regarding the judge and the sentence that she served, um, yeah, it must have been against that backdrop of the civil rights. You wouldn't get that short period, even with all those statements, so it's got to be a, a, a connection somewhere. That just it doesn't happen. No. I can also say that the, there were some people that uh, stepped in and, and talked and told what, what Helen had. There is there's a, was a radio journalist called uh, Ed Williams who had a famous red radio, just radio show in, in New York in the 60s. He was close to, to Lee and Helen and he really know what Helen had meant to Lee. And so he also gave a speech at, at Lee's funeral and I, I know that I don't think that Lee's actual family was so happy about what he said but, but he just talked about let's not forget about what Helen did. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, so some people s- speak on her behalf even th- during those days. Mm. Yes, I think it's fascinating what, what what we see and what we're even talking about it. The mythologies that come up yeah. in, in mm-hmm. a way sometimes you don't want them any other way, and then then there's connections to real people with real lives and real law. Uh, it's a different time. It's a it's a a, a bit of history. Uh, brought vividly to life by your interviews, by the music, by Francis Wall's photos, Bradford Young cinematography. We haven't mentioned the man who shot yeah. uh, uh, Arrival is currently shooting Blade Runner for Denis Villeneuve as well. So that's a decent cinematography you got there. Absolutely. That uh, very quick. That, I mean, I'm so tired today. <laughs> but what I wanted to say earlier, very quick, was that we had that was uh, uh, a challenge in this film was that we had all those there's fantastic visual material for Lee in the film and his music, but with Helen we only, only had the voice. So, so of course that was a challenge. I am not a fan of reenactments. Uh, I did not want to do reenactments, so I did not don't know how to, to do this. And I, we had a lot of fantastic archival footage to work with, but still we needed to find a way to, to visualize her world. Uh, so, so. Me and Brad worked, on, uh, we, we used old Bolex cameras and just pushed 60 millimeters film, yeah. a little bit extra, two stops. And uh, so it should be a little bit more like found snippets of home movies combined with more like a poetic, whatever that is, uh, style of it. Uh, so, yeah. Well, you chose the judges the, are out there, but that's the world, how we The world's best <laughs> cinematographer and the first uh, black cinematographer ever to be nominated for an Oscar in, in Bradford Young as yeah. well. So, He's fantastic, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to see him. Yeah, we really need well. to mention But him. really, it all started with, like, uh, I called him Morgan, that's where it all started. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it remains, it's a fascinating film. And we're all going to go home and listen to a bit more Lee Morgan, including the Sidewinder. Yeah. Of course. It's not snowing outside. I at, at least, snowing. at least. That's the British well, summer. We can at least promise no snow. But what we can promise is that uh, please go and tell uh, your friends about the film. It will be on Netflix in the UK soon. But for now, uh, it is here in the UK. I think a few more nights and next week here and at the Bertha Dock House. Please tell everyone. It will Listen be here for a, a week. Uh, he's joining least. me on Robert Elms' show on BBC London tomorrow uh, as well, uh, when we'll definitely play. We might play the Sidewinder. Uh, I, you'll be on at 11. I've got to yeah. tell him that. He won't wake up. Uh, 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. in the morning, BBC London 94.9. But for now, you've had him live. He is Casper Collin. Hey. Thank you. And, and also, I just want to say thank you to you. Fantastic that you stayed. Uh, I, I love this. And as, as this gentleman said, uh, it's coming to Netflix a little bit later. But we worked hard to push the Netflix date for UK so you could see it on a, in a cinema. Mm, yeah. 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 Because I think that uh, yeah. we worked a lot, uh, and it is a film that I think you should see in a cinema. Yeah, but well you can you yeah. can hear the Reggie Workman's yeah. bass. You can hear that coming up through the floor. Yeah. That's so, the best uh, to hear. It will as well. Yeah. Will there be any extras on the DVD? Uh, I will work hard <laughs> <laughs> for you. Yeah, you can you, you can do like a request list, and I will. It's like a Christmas list. Yeah. Si and, and he's also doing Giles Peterson's worldwide uh, special, a Lee Morgan special. We've yeah. convinced Giles to do one. Uh, we're recording it tomorrow. It's also uh, it's on Friday at ten or two. Shit. So yeah. are you going out live or whenever that goes out anymore? Yeah, you, you right. can find these things whenever they you know they yeah. play or whatever. But Giles Peterson worldwide, excellent. Uh, and Giles is a big fan. Uh, please tell all your friends. Uh, I love. I called him Morgan. Uh, uh, and. I, can I tell them that we it may be made it may be being made into a feature? Yeah, if you, if you want to, you, I can you, tell. You, you, you I'm going to tell you. It might be made, I heard it might be being made into a feature. I know no more. You told them. I don't know what the story will be, and maybe and Sidewinder, Sidewinder will be in out. that. And <laughs> yeah. 